Hello to everyone and welcome to episode two of CCLG's Research Talks for Parents and Public. I'm Ellie Wilkinson and my job is sharing research with all of our supporters. So um, to start with some housekeeping, um, we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So please do submit your questions uh, whenever you think of them using the Q&A button, uh, button, which should just be down there. Um, if you'd like to use the chat function, please make sure you've set the to drop down to everyone or people may not see your messages. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we will send recording out in the next few days. So uh, this month's talk is called How Do You Out Google Google? And it's being led by Dr. Jess Morgan. Jess is a senior research fellow in paediatric oncology and a paediatric oncology trainee at Leeds Children's Hospital. Her research aims to improve supportive care of children and young people with cancer using systematic reviews, qualitative research and clinical trials. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jess. Thank you, Ellie. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and check that you can see. Um, have you got my first slide? Yes, all good. All good. There we go. Technical challenge passed. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us this evening. I know it's a really big um, ask to uh, spend some time thinking about research when we all have really busy lives um, and there's a lot of demands on that time. I'm, uh, like Ellie said, uh, a clinical academic in Yorkshire, which means I've got two jobs. Um, yeah, I'm a doctor at Leeds Children's Hospital in the Paediatric Oncology Service. Um, and I'm also a senior research fellow at the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination at the University of York. And this evening, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a research process called a systematic review. And I'm going to use one of our projects called Reforms as an example of how we can use that method um, in childhood cancer to answer some really tricky questions. Really happy to have uh, questions um, at the end, so please do put them in the chat um, and we'll try and tackle those for you. So first of all, what is Reforms? Well, the Reforms project uh, has got a long title. Uh, it's about understanding decision making for relapsed and refractory rhabdomyosarcoma. And these are big long words that I'm going to explain later in the talk. But once you see that title, you can kind of see why I'm going to call it Reforms all the way through. It's a research project that's funded by the CCLG and it runs out of our department at the University of York and with our colleagues at the University of Surrey. We've got a, a really um, brilliant Twitter handle there where you'll see us talking about a lot of the research that we do and um, helping to explain how research happens. Um, so if you're on Twitter, uh, would really recommend that you link up with us there. And um, this is the uh, reforms research team. Um, there are a few faces there who you'll recognize, um, some who might be new to you. Um, but these are the guys who do all the really hard work that I'm going to share today. And I'm going to give a particular shout out to Lucy and Connor, who have done a lot of the work in designing some of the, the visual um, aspects of today's presentation. And um, they're absolutely fantastic at, at the infographics. The research team in this project are supported throughout um, by our parent group and clinical advisory group. And I'll talk a little bit more about how they help and support us um, later on in the talk, but they really are part of this reforms project team. So what is rhabdomyosarcoma? Well, rhabdomyosarcoma is uh, the commonest form of soft tissue sarcoma in children and young people. That means it's a form of cancer um, that occurs in the soft tissues, so the muscles or tendons, anything that's not your bones or your organs. It can happen anywhere from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. And it's a really varied disease. It can happen from when you're a tiny baby, right the way up, uh, to a much older adult, but it's commoner in children and young people. It can happen in any gender, and it's not, got lots of different subtypes, like embryonal, alveolar, 
and many other rarer types. It can be in just one place in your body or it can spread elsewhere. Um, and that makes it uh, sort of a very um, complex disease to, to think about and to treat. When children or young people are first diagnosed with rhabdo, um, their first treatments are really clearly defined. They've been explored and studied over the years and they tailor to all of those different factors about the young person and their cancer. Treatment will involve chemotherapy um, with treatments for specific sites of disease like surgery or radiotherapy. And with that treatment, many children who develop rhabdomyosarcoma do very well um, and their disease goes away. But for some, their disease comes back after treatment or their disease doesn't respond to the treatment that we started in the first place. When disease comes back, that's called a relapse. Or if it doesn't respond, it's called refractory. And relapsed and refractory rhabdomyosarcoma is what we're interested in, in reforms. The first time a child or young person experiences relapsed or refractory disease, um, there's a recommended treatment called FIT, which is chemotherapy with or without the surgery and radiotherapy that's needed. But what if after that, there's still a relapse or refractory disease? And that's the challenging situation where reforms focuses. At this point, families um, are offered a, a variety of different options. And these can kind of be grouped into four different areas. Aggressive chemotherapy um, with the intention of achieving cure, um, however challenging that might be. Other option is to give treatments, often chemotherapies, to try to reduce the amount of disease that a child has. That would aim to help reduce the symptoms, give them more time with their family. You might choose uh, just to aim to control symptoms without necessarily aiming to control or reduce the amount of disease there is. And the, the fourth option that we, we might think about are experimental trials. And as researchers, we often refer to these as early phase trials. Those are studies of um, new treatments for relapsed or refractory rhabdomyosarcoma of lots of different kinds. And uh, early phase studies, when researchers are designing these, they're designed to um, understand more about these new treatments. They're designed to figure out what the right dose might be or how to give it. They're designed to understand what the side effects of particular treatments might be. And they're designed to understand how different drugs might work together. The early phase studies are not designed to understand um, whether those treatments work for um, a particular disease. It's not that intention. That would usually be explored in what's called later phase trials. Sometimes, however, the early phase trials will report how the children in that study did, what happened to them, what happened with their, with their rhabdomyosarcoma. They're often very small and they've got a small number of children in those studies. So it be, can be really difficult to understand what has happened. So families have got these, these really challenging um, decisions to make and they, they talk to us um, about how hard making decisions about these options are. Weighing up what's important to them and what's important to their family. Families tell us um, that they use lots of different ways to make decisions in this situation. They might talk to their healthcare professionals, the doctors and um, nurses and other professionals who they know really well by this point. They might talk to other patients and families that they've met uh, along the way, um, either uh, in person or online or through other routes. 
They might look at trusted websites like the CCLG, who've got loads of information about the options when disease comes back. But families also tell us that very often when they're faced with these really challenging situations, they Google, what are the best options now? And Google is a fantastic tool, isn't it? It's really, really wonderful for um, answering our questions. And you might have used Google today. I know I definitely have. It's really quick. It gives us loads of information and it's right at our fingertips. It's brilliant. But there are some problems with Google, aren't there? When you put in a question, there can be an overwhelming amount of information that comes back. Huge, huge numbers of hits. And you know, how do you take all of that information in? How do you know that the information that Google is giving you is really good? That it's high quality? How do you know you found everything? How do you know that the answer to your question isn't on the next page? And who checks your work when you're reading so much? How do you not miss something? How do you understand all the technicalities, all the details, all the really scientific words that people put into research? So Google's fab, but it's got real challenges. And that's where the kind of research that we use really comes in and, and, and helps. This method called systematic reviews is a way of doing research to pull together all of the information and research that's ever been done in an area and to look at it, assess it and bring it together in a way that um, is designed to help with all of those issues. At the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination, we are specialists in systematic reviews. It's what we do. Um, so we are really experienced in using this tool. When you start a systematic review to answer a particular question, you write a plan beforehand. You think about that question. What is it we're really trying to figure out? What's important? what might help us to answer this question and you you write that design down for us in reforms that question was what early phase studies have already been done in relapsed and refractory rhabdomyosarcoma? sarcoma what did they show about how these treatments work and for which children might some treatments work better than others and we share that plan with other people because that then keeps us accountable to doing what we said we would do, helps us to keep on track with our question. So we did our plan for reforms and then we follow the six steps of a systematic review. And this is one of those infographics that I was telling you about. It is amazing. This is the six steps of a systematic review. And I'm going to take you through them one by one explain what they're for, why they're important, how we do them, and what we found in reforms. So step one is to search for the studies. We don't actually use Google. We use some uh, research databases, which are places where you can look for all research journal articles, and um, you can look for conference presentation information, um, and you can look for studies that are ongoing. And we search all of those for any study that's been completed in most systematic reviews. But in reforms, we're also looking at the studies that are currently ongoing. So we have an understanding of what research is likely to be giving us finished results in the years to come. That search for studies is really broad. You're looking for absolutely everything and trying not to miss anything. So you look for an awful lot. In reforms, in our searches, we had over 17,000 hits. We call them records. 17,000 potentially relevant um, pieces of work. And once you've got all of those, you then need to sort through them and find the ones that really are relevant. 
you need to look at each study and say, does this help us to answer that question that we set at the beginning? And in your plan, you've normally picked which studies they will be in terms of they must include children and young people with relapsed and refractory or abdominal sarcoma, for example. And sorting through 17,000 records, you can imagine, is quite an undertaking. And we're humans, and we might occasionally misread something or mispick something up. So we actually already build in that two people will look at every single one of those so that we pick all the relevant studies up. And if we disagree, we talk about whether they should be in or out against those clear criteria that we've set. So at the end of step two, which takes quite a while, you have uh, your studies that are included, that are relevant. And in reforms, we've got over 100 currently open studies and about 125, 130 finished studies that are included. Once you have that for each study, you move on to extracting the key details. So instead of um, having every journal article printed out and looked at, we pull out the pieces that help us to answer our question. That will be what methods did the researchers use? Who took part in that research? What treatments were they given and what happened to them afterwards? That all goes into a, a really big spreadsheet to allow us uh, to do the next steps. Once we've extracted those key details, we also look at every study for its quality and we examine it to know whether it has any potential challenges in how it was designed or performed that might make us doubt the results that it has found. Now, the evaluation of whether research is very good is, is quite a big skill. Um, and it's something that all of our researchers are trained in and they use tools to help them and guide them so that they're every study they look at the key factors that might influence the quality and how trustworthy the answer of that study is and that we can then use that information to guide us in understanding what the research has shown and to knowing how much weight to give to that study as we move along now in step three and step four, we're still humans and we still might make an occasional unintentional error. So we check each other's work. Every study that is extracted or quality assessed is checked by another researcher to make sure we really are getting the right answers. And then once we've got all of that information, we start to combine the results from the studies. And we might do that in lots of different ways. If there are lots of numbers um, and we think we might be able to add them up, we can use statistical tests that do that in a way that's reliable and helps us to understand the maths. If there aren't numbers we can add up, we can look at the studies and compare their similarities, their differences, and the different things that they've done to help us understand the clinical problem or question that we were asking. It's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, and you've all done jigsaw puzzles. It takes that one little study, that little piece of information, and it builds it up into a bigger picture of what is best, what works. But also what jigsaw puzzles are really good at is highlighting where there are gaps, where there's a missing puzzle piece that we don't know about, and where more research is needed to develop and to understand in a certain area where you might need to build in the future to get a better picture. So we will do both of those things in reforms and this is the stage that we're currently at is this putting together of all of the jigsaw puzzle pieces and identifying where the missing gaps are. Once we've done that we'll be sharing our findings um, which is uh, a really key part of the research process. It's about taking what we've learned, taking that picture and showing it to patients and families, to healthcare professionals so that they've got the information to provide the best possible care that, that they can. We'll take it to researchers and help them understand where more work is needed. And we're also going to take it to people who fund research 
um, who make policy and who commission healthcare services to show them what we already know and where more money funding investment is needed to understand better. So those are the six steps of a systematic review. Um, but I told you that there's a really um, important underlying group, and that for us is our parent group. Um, this image shows how our parent group currently runs, which is us on screen on Zoom, uh, talking to some phenomenal parents who share with us and guide us and support us in reforms to do the best possible research. They are our critical friends. They tell us when we're getting it right. They tell us when we're getting it wrong, how we could do better. They help to motivate us by reminding us why our research is important and how it matters. And they help us to prioritize. One example is that in reforms, we looked at for all of these treatments at the side effects of those treatments. We collected hundreds of side effects and all described differently in different studies. And our parent group really helped and guided us in knowing which of those matter most to parents and families so that we can highlight those and bring those to the attention of people who need the research. Without losing any of the detail, we've still got those hundreds of pieces of information, but they've helped us to prioritize what's most important. And they've helped us to highlight where studies don't tell us haven't answered the most important questions so that we can help researchers to understand how to do things better in the future. They also help to translate our research and tell us when we're talking like researchers and not like normal humans. And they help us to explain what we do in words that are, are better than the ones that we might have used um, in the first place. We're really grateful for our parent group in reforms. They're so valuable and they're such a key part of our team. Um, and if you're a patient or a parent and you think you might like to um, help and support researchers like our parent group do, then you could get involved too. You could speak to people like the CCLG about other researchers who need this kind of input, or you can contact us, even if it's not our area of research, we'll be able to help and find researchers who you might want to work with. So that's our amazing parent group. What next with reforms? Well, the original reforms project consisted of two things, the systematic review that I've told you about and a qualitative study. That's researcher speak, isn't it? That means interviews. And that's trying to understand how people make those decisions in relapsed and refractory rhabdomyosarcoma about the different options that are available to them. And we're talking to families who have experience of that situation and how they made those choices. I'm not going to talk about the qualitative study today because it's currently open and recruiting people to take part. And I don't want to influence how the data is collected. So I'm going to leave that there and just say that we hope that both studies will have results to share with you in very early 2023. We're then as a team going to work um, with our parent group and with healthcare professionals to produce a best practice statement to guide healthcare professionals in understanding what these two studies found, what they mean and how they can best provide care for children and young people with relapsed and refractory rhabdo. And that was where we originally planned to finish reforms. But there have been two additional projects uh, that have come out of our work so far. One is called Local Reforms. Local Reforms looks at local treatments. So where chemotherapy uh, treats your whole body, local treatments treat a specific area, surgery, radiotherapy. And these kind of treatments are often not explored in early phase studies. They use different kinds of methods to understand how helpful or not those different treatments might be. So local reforms is looking at other forms of research to help us to understand what might be the best treatments in relapsed and refractory disease in terms of surgery and radiotherapy. That's in the earlier phases of the systematic review six steps is somewhere around stage three, stage four. 
at the moment. So it will come out a bit later than the other work, but we hope will be really helpful um, in this community. And the final uh, spin-off project is something called Living Reforms. Living Reforms uh, is funded by CCLG and by Alice's Arc. And it aims to address a particular problem in systematic reviews. So in those six steps, it, there's a lot of work involved in working through each one, and that takes some time. In reforms, we did our initial search of the literature in summer of 2021, and we're now nearly into 2023 and about to get some results. But we know research has happened since then, and there might be more to learn. Living reforms is what's called a living review. And that means that when you get through the process, the six steps, it will then go back to the beginning and look again for what's been new or different since you last combined the results. So we will cycle through two or three times per year, searching for information, sifting it through, uh, extracting all the data, assessing the quality, and then combining it with what we already knew and sharing it out. So we will go round and round and forever be providing updated, high quality research that you can trust about um, relapsed and refractory rhabdo. And because we know academic publishing takes a while, that isn't the way for us to share that research. We're going to create an online resource where patients, parents um, and professionals can go and access all the information in reforms. You can understand the methods and what we found will translate those tricky words and phrases into ones that make sense. And we will help and support the information that people need to make decisions. We really hope that living reforms will be the way in relapsed and refractory rhabdo where you can out Google Google. But this is the first ever living systematic review in children's cancer. Living systematic reviews have been done in other conditions like COVID, where there's lots and lots of research happening. But nobody's done it in children with cancer before. And there's some additional questions about how we might best do that. So as researchers, we're working on the methods for how do you best do this kind of research. We're exploring and evaluating different ways and trying them out and comparing them against the methods that people have used in the past. We hope that by the end of the first couple of years of living reforms, we will know how to do this kind of research best. And so then the big question will be, how can we use this method in other ways? What else could we use it for? Could we have living neuroblastoma? Living medulloblastoma? Places where families and professionals who are facing difficult decisions in relapsed and refractory disease can go and find out what research has already been done. And are there any other tricky questions in children's cancer we could possibly try to answer by constantly looking at the evidence base and assessing its quality. How do we, as a community of people who care about children and young people with cancer, out Google, Google. Thank you so much for listening today. Um, and I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have. So I uh, just want to say thank you because that was really interesting. Um, I always found this project really interesting. It's such a new concept, um, well, to me at least. Um, so I did have a question for you just to get us started. Yeah. Um, so will keeping living reforms up to date, will that be like a full time job? Will you be keeping <laughs> people in addition to like your normal research? Um, so that is a great question, Ellie. To start off with, um, at the moment, it's it's one of the projects that I 
work on. And the researchers in the team are also funded to spend some of their time, but they also do other really exciting systematic review work. One of the questions about figuring out how do we do this best is how much researcher time is needed? Is there any of this process that could be given, for example, to automation um, that could be done with less human input and um, that that might speed it up? but also would sort of release those researchers to do other research that might be really important. Um, so that's one of our uh, questions along the way is, is how much time does this take? Okay. Um, so we have had another an anonymous question come in. So it says, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that the doctors get the results of this and change what they do? Fantastic question. Um, so this is, this is something called implementation science or or we sometimes call it dissemination. Um, how do we share our results? Uh, so we do things like this. So we know that, that doctors and healthcare professionals watch these kind of talks as well. We go to um, doctors and researchers in uh, their own conferences, academic settings. We share it in the journals that, that doctors read. We work with the CCLG to share that information. So for example, that best practice statement that we're working on that will um, go to CCLG and be shared with healthcare professionals who need it and it, it, essentially we talk about it an awful lot um, with anyone who we think might be working with children and people with Rapto. So I did have another question if that's okay. Yeah okay. Um, so is so I know um, you're already working on the reforms project and living reforms came about because of that um, is living reforms for rhabdo, is that going to be the end of this concept or is it, will it go further in the rhabdomyosarcoma field or will it just be translating to other cancer types? Oh, that is a fantastic question. I, I have got so many questions here and, and part of what we're working with as a team is, is figuring out what are the key questions? Are there other pieces of research that need to be drawn together? Um, that would take a lot more researcher time um, and research money, but, but maybe some of the ones that pop up in my head are, what about some of the studies um, that are, are before we start testing um, treatments in children and young people, but we're in that early lab development. How do you bring studies like that together and learn from them? Um, or uh, there might be studies about um, sort of how do you provide care and how best do we understand how to support families in this situation so I think there's so much to do um I I could list off lots of things <laughs> and need lots of money to do it <laughs> you sound quite excited by all of the possibilities yeah I think this is a really important um situation it's it's a place where um we need to know more and we need to know better answers for children and young people and their families um, and so if we can do that we should be doing that yeah yeah so um i think we'll just answer one more of my questions to see if anyone else wants to answer a question everybody's uh, very quiet in the audience <laughs> is i think it's coming up for christmas and everyone wants to be tucked up in their blankets Absolutely. Um, so um, why is it that um, it's only really like uh, chemotherapy and medical interventions that are tracked in early phase studies? Are local, uh, local interventions, is surgeries more done on an ad hoc basis or are they not studied in the same way? Yeah, uh, that's a fantastic question. It's, I think, um, about definitions of, of what's early phase, um, and, and how those have classically been designed as research methods. Um, so like I said, they're often about dose finding or um, about how you, you bring treatments together, um, which, which isn't really a question that you have about surgery or about radiotherapy. There is a question in radiotherapy, but it's, it's not so much yeah. a question in, in surgery. And so there are actually some really talented researchers out there, for example, a team in, in Bristol, who are starting to try to figure out what is an early phase study in surgery? What 
what do they look like and how are they best done? Because generally um, those studies would be, be more sort of looking at when people have changed or done different surgeries, what worked best. So starting to understand how we use those terms early phase in surgery and radiotherapy is actually a piece of work that researchers are doing and that when those findings come out we'll be able to incorporate those into how we think about reforms and those kind of local therapy questions uh, for reforms. Okay and I have one more question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just wondering with, I know you're planning on um, hosting the Living Reforms uh, app or portal on the CCLG website. Will it be the same like interface for clinicians and for families or will you be working on separate screens? Fantastic question, Ellie. Um, so first of all, yes, it will be online. Um, we're figuring out exactly where it will sit in terms of CCLG and Alice's Arc, who are our other funders. Um, and how they will all interact, but you will be able to access from, from both places. Um, part of our work now as a team is designing that resource and talking with healthcare professionals and families about how that should look. Um, so actually, it's not my decision um, whether people will have different ways of accessing it. It will be through working with those different groups to design something that's functional for what they want to use it for. Um, so in the new year, if anyone out there is interested, we're going to be starting to hold some workshops um, about starting to understand how to design that. So if you'd like to take part, then uh, please do get in contact with the reforms team because we've got um, those workshops to run and we want to understand what people want from that resource. It'd be really interesting to see the differences between them and see just I, I guess how different brains work and what is better for people yeah um and uh, how we make it as accessible and interactive so that people can find what what they want from that information resource yeah so i think i'm probably not going to get any more questions um, no one will just popped up oh go for it do you want me to read it out oh so some i, I can read it i think you said some studies don't look at the important things. How can you make researchers do the right thing and tell us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. Um, this is a whole talk in and of itself, how to change what researchers do. Just flicked over there. Um, so lots of different ways. The first of which is defining what the important questions are, and what, what the right ways um, to design research are for everyone, um, because Patients and families have, have important questions. Clinicians and healthcare professionals have really important questions. Um, and then researchers, research funders, and the people who provide services really matter as well. And um, figuring out what those important things are is part of being a researcher. We might use processes like the CCLG's um, priority setting partnership. Okay, so that. That was a process for looking for what are the important research questions. We might um, also then have things like parent groups and clinical advisory groups in primary research. So in the, not the systematic review, but the step before that, the first studies, helping to guide researchers to make sure they do that design the best they can. For us as systematic reviewers, we can talk a lot about how we think researchers can do better research. So we'll be uh, writing that in all of the different outputs. We will be um, presenting that to researchers as things that we saw either us, our parents group or, or our clinical advisory groups thought was important but that we couldn't find and encouraging researchers to do that better. And there's lots and lots of work being done to try to uh, encourage this process along the way. It's quite a hard day. <laughs> We're getting better in stages. <laughs> I hope I answered your question, whoever that was out there. So I think, yes, we're probably not going to have any more questions unless anyone has a, a little quick one they want to put in. Um, staring at the Q&A panel, but nothing's appearing. So I think we will probably end it there if that's okay. Um,
So I want to say thank you very much for joining us to all of the attendees and also thank you Jess for your fantastic talk. Um, so the talk has been recorded and we'll be sending out in a few days if you want to share it or watch it again or anything. Um, you'll also be receiving an email shortly to ask for your feedback. Um, so this is so we can make sure that our talks are the best they can be and are you know actually helping parents and the public. Um, so if you could take a couple of minutes to let us know what you think, that would be fantastic. And um, yeah, thank you again to Jess. Thank you very much for having me, Ellie. No problem. All right. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye.